Corporate responsibility has moved um, from the margins to the mainstream, and likewise, the demand for ethical activity has moved from the wacky activist margins of society into the consumer and the business mainstream. Uh, so join me in next welcoming Jeff Swartz, um, who will challenge us to go beyond business as usual and invest in people and technologies to create a world where everyone has the opportunity to progress. Please join me in welcoming um, Jeff Schwartz, um, businessman and philanthropist, former CEO of Timberland. Thanks, how are you doing? You all right? It's the end of the day. People are tired. I think it's pretty inspiring to talk about end of life. I think it's pretty inspiring to talk about how Scream can uh, make, can use technology in order to enable different medical outcomes for citizens. I think what's really powerful about both of those stories is that there's a market mechanism that allows us to evaluate whether those are good ideas or bad ideas. And so we don't have to ask ourselves the question, are they good or bad? The market will tell us. But there's a question I have for you as investors in Israel and investors in the kind of innovation and technology that's being talked about. The question I have for you respectfully but with, 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 uh, with uh, urgency is what responsibility, what obligation do we have we who are investors in Israeli innovation, in the social fabric of the country where this innovation comes from. Does it matter to us as investors that there are gaps in the social fabric? There's gaps in the social fabric in every functioning democracy in the world, and for sure, we can agree there are gaps in the social fabric of Israel. Why do we care about that as investors? The question is, do we or don't we? And my answer humbly, but insistently as we do. We don't care because we're good people. We care for the exact same reason as the entrepreneurs that just pitched to us. We care because there's an there's a outcome. There's a measurable outcome that's important to us as investors. I ran Timberland for 30 years in the global economy. Our business was boots and shoes and clothes. I was at Facebook yesterday. I guess everybody gets to say that. That was my first and my last visit. It was a really exciting experience to see the kitchens and the food and the golf carts and the place to get a haircut and all this other stuff. And I, I stood by and I watched people kind of washing around on Facebook Way or whatever it's called. And I saw a really interesting thing. I saw the face of diverse talent. I heard the story about the job of the CEO is to create a culture in which people want to come to work. Without the engineers, you can't do your business. I understood that because at Timberland, we made boots. It's not kind of, it's nowhere near as cool and exciting as the technologies you just pitched. But that's what we did for a living, and I took that seriously. And you need great raw materials, and you need a certain amount of pretty low tech, but you need technology. But if you want to make the best boots and shoes and clothes on earth, you need the hands, the hearts, and the souls of craftsmen. The same problem, if Facebook's providing free food and booze, at Timberland, the craftspeople that we needed to attract, that the difference between our economic proposition succeeding and failing, still this question of talent was central to the business. And so we didn't operate in Silicon Valley, that factor was in the Dominican Republic. And the Dominican Republic is not different than Haifa or Silicon Valley, it's just a place where the talent exists and you need the talent. And so the question is, what's the relationship of social fabric to talent? And the question for me was, was self-evident in the Dominican Republic because the education system doesn't work and that puts a burden on me. If you can't read, then I need to have to actually figure out how to help you read in order to train you to be the kind of craftsperson I need you to be. And that's not a trick because the first trick is I gotta get you to the factory. And if the transportation systems don't exist, I have a problem, not a social problem, I have a business problem. And that's why the shuttles at Facebook are so sophisticated and they run a natural gas and they're really sleek and they probably have internet connections. We didn't have any of those things at Timberland. We had a bus that would pick you up in your village because if you didn't come on our bus that you didn't, and you didn't go to our education system, we couldn't make the kinds of boots and shoes that we wanted to make. The competition for talent was self-interested and it was absolutely directly connected to the notion of social fabric. So why should we think about failures in the social fabric? What do we think about an education system that's struggling an or a welfare system that's not performing? What do you think about a healthcare system that's under pressure? What does that have to do with scream? Everything. The shortage of engineers in Israel today? Anybody find that interesting? Anybody find that relevant as an investor? Anybody see the, the competition for talent as one that's tilting in the wrong direction for intellectual capital in Israel? People see the four different tribes in Israel, 
the ultra-religious Jews, the Arabs, the religious Jews and the non-religious, traditional religious Jews, these four different tribes unable to collaborate and have a conversation, that's not my problem. Let the New York Times spread lies about that. We don't need to talk about that. We're investors. Yes, we are investors, but if the social fabric doesn't work, then your ability to create predictably flows of, of attractive investments uh, out of Israel won't, it will cease to exist. Not in alarmist terms, that's a long way away, but I'm trying to make the case to you as, as investors, self-interested investors in innovation in Israel, that you do care and need to be invested in the social fabric in Israel. I want to say to you with respect that Israel is the land of innovation and resilience. And so innovation and resilience is not just, can you come up with something that tells you how to beat the traffic? Yes, they can. Can you come up with a way to put a micro, a max, a macro computer inside your car, or whatever screen does? Yes, they can. But there's also social innovations in Israel, social innovations of real consequence. There are some really cool things to see. So Ronald Cohen, who is the founder of Apex Partners, just sold the first social bond in Israel. Pay for performance about diabetes, a way to use public private partnership across sector collaborations to work on a social problem. Does that matter to you as an investor? Nah, because healthcare costs aren't relevant to you. So what the hell, let them have diabetes. Somebody else will figure it out. Governments are so good at solving social problems, we don't need to worry about it. Actually, my view is we do, but I just, just one guy's opinion, and I'm an unemployed boot salesman, so who knows anyways. But it's not the only place where social innovation is happening in Israel. Have anybody been to Tel Aviv? Yes, of course you have, because you're going to Herzliya, and you're going to make another deal because you're in the flow. you got to have a steak. you got to have a good steak. Go to Liliot. Liliot is a great kosher restaurant. It's a, they make a great steak. It's a good wine list. They're nice people. The service is great. And when you eat the steak and drink the wine, you'll also be investing in the social fabric because Liliot is a public it's a business, a for-profit business that partners with Elm, which is an organization that takes children off the street and back into life. And you will never see that because it's in the back room because they're teaching those kids how to have a profession and how to have a life, and you don't know it. You just got a good steak and a good glass of wine. But that's an investment of innovation in the social fabric. Dualis, Alan Barkat from Apex Partners is creating this notion of social business, Israel Venture Network. By the way, these are hard case, serious business people, almost as serious and tough as you are, investing in the social fabric. And they're nice people and they're good people, but that's not why they're doing it. They understand the link between a social fabric that works and a business environment that does, and they also understand the inverse, that it doesn't work, the, the, the innovation that we count on, that we invest in, we earn a return from, we'll see to be sustainable and predictable. There are other vehicles. Everybody wants to talk about Shimona Time. Everybody knows about Unit 8200. Do you know about the 10 businesses that they incubate every single year whose purpose is to link business and social profit? For profit businesses. Businesses that are trying to correct a social failure and earn a profit doing it. That is innovative. That, those are vehicles of innovation. Mass Challenge went from Boston to Jerusalem. A nonprofit incubator, for profit companies in order to create jobs. What kind of jobs? Across all the tribes. Mass Challenge Jerusalem will have Palestinian entrepreneurs, will have Bedouin entrepreneurs, will have Haredi entrepreneurs. Actually, they're all different shapes and sizes. Yes, entrepreneurs. And they all come from communities that need to nurture and sustain them. Because it's a son of a gun to be a successful coder if you don't know math. Because your high school system sucked. And so you actually have to invest in the education system if you want coders and engineers to do the kind of work you want to do. Now, I know you know that, and I sound preachy, but I've, I feel the desperation because I see the fabric not tearing, but certainly straining in Israel, a place that I love and believe in and, and have, I'm all in against from a perspective not just of my heart, but also of my head. I see the innovation that comes out, life-saving innovations that can create unbelievable light in the world, and the world is a dark place. I want to be one like you. I want to be a builder of the light. I want to see the energy, the creative energy from the four tribes shine forth in Israel. I want to see a sustainable stream of innovative ideas coming from all of the tribes. I do believe in economic inclusion, and I believe that that Israel has a unique opportunity to demonstrate not only the coolest technology that will change marketplaces, but also a paradigm for how that innovation gets sustainably delivered. Education system that actually educates all the children, the ones from the periphery as the ones from the center. Not by accident of geography, you were born in this zip code so you're okay, and you're born in that zip code so you're not okay. You're an Arab from the north and it doesn't work. You're a Bedouin from the south, it doesn't work. We say, we say from the inside out in Israel, no. 
No, 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 that's not the way it has to be. Now, that's a great speech, isn't it? Are you as excited as I am? This is an outstanding presentation. I got two and a half more seconds. But I didn't come to tell you inspirational things about the great things that are happening in Israel. Because you know about the great, and you know about the hard, and you see how they rub together. And if I've done anything effective, at least get you thinking about what's my job to close the gap. The best and brightest who depend on the economic engine that is centered in socioeconomic resilience, and people who can, you know, 15 years ago, they said Israel was going to dry up and go away. I'm not talking about the Guardian that's still saying that. I'm not talking about the BDS folks that's still trying to do that. I'm talking about just the fact there's no water. There's just no water. And so, but you know what's so powerful about a paradigm that's built on talented leaders that can work cross-sectorally? It's an unnatural thing, but look what they did. Israel's in a place where we can be a net exporter of water technology. Is really technology driving water solutions in Southern California in face of drought? That's an intersection of public policy and private genius and NGO activism. That is trisectoral, cross-sectoral collaboration, and it's, it's not a one-off, it's a paradigm. And it's a paradigm that goes with the notion of light unto the nations. That is what a Jewish democratic state is supposed to stand for. Ways blows my mind, but the water technology absolutely rocks my soul because it's, an, it's, a, it's a proof text of what happens when you put together these different sectors and they work together in ways to create uh, a common good. Do you believe in the possibility of common good in Israel? I, uh, I hope you do. If you do believe in the need for common good in Israel, as relevant to your business as, as investors, as CEOs, then I hope you will consider your role in the civic square. At Timberland, I invested in the education of our employees in the Dominican Republic. I invested in the transportation infrastructure. I invested in the nutrition and their health. I was, in, I was, what, a benign patrician liberal from Boston? No, I was a hard-ass CEO of a publicly traded company, and I earned my fortune by recognizing the connection between the, the different sectors that create the social fabric that enables the engine of commerce to hum. I hope you will consider, as you think about the investments you make in Israel, as you think about the entrepreneurs you back, as you think about the issues you'll attack, as you think about the value you'll create for yourself and for your shareholders, that there is a role for you as a for-profit leader and creating a social fabric that will sustain this experiment in democracy that is intended to be a light unto the nations. Thank you.